in Western culture, especially in the United States where pluralism and relativism and consumerism are the adage of the day. There are many people who mistakenly think if there is a God and an afterlife that there must be many ways to get there, many ways to ascend the mountain. They think like seasoned mountain climbers who know that every mountain has multiple ways to get up to the top. That even with a mountain such as Everest, the tallest and most dangerous mountain at 29,030 feet, that there are two main routes that people climb up to the peak and there are 18 different named routes that climbers can choose from. And they falsely assume in our culture that that is the way that eternal life works as well. But our passage this morning reveals the truth of the matter. But it not only reveals the truth, it reveals God's heart behind that truth. Please open up your Bibles with me this morning to Genesis 25, 1 through 18. Genesis 25, 1 through 18. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered Shedan, Sheba, and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Ashuriam, Latushim, Lumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephor, Hanak, Abida, and Eldea. And these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. While he was still living, and he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward into the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave at Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham had purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lahairoi. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Adbeel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jeter, Naphish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their encampments, twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people. They settled at Havilah to Shur, which is the opposite of Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. Here ends the reading of God's word. Sometimes it is much more difficult to see what we are supposed to see in a passage and to learn what we are supposed to learn. To find Christ and the gospel in some passages versus other passages can be kind of a difficult task. And that is the case with the scripture that is before us this morning. But 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us all scripture is God-breathed and useful for us. And Luke 24, Jesus taught on the road to Emmaus that all scripture is ultimately about him and a fulfillment of the covenant of grace, a fulfillment of God's story of redemption that was first promised in the Garden of Eden. And we can be assured that this story points us to Jesus, and there is gospel life for us in these passages as well. This is God's inerrant and infallible and very useful word. 
This section of God's word tells us about more than the death of Abraham. It tells us about his son Isaac, the chosen one, the sole heir, elected for a purpose, to move God's plan forward, his plan of salvation, toward the ultimate one who is foreshadowed here, the one who would come and provide the only way to make it up to the summit, the only way to make it to heaven and to have a relationship with God. This section is broken down into three different parts, verses 1 through 6 talking about Keturah, verses 7 through 11 telling us about Isaac, and verses 12 through 18 telling us about Ishmael. But all of these are really to, meant to tell us about God and his faithfulness to his promise, his covenant of grace that he first gave back in the garden but caused to move forward in a giant step forward with Abraham. Telling us this morning there is one who would inherit that promise, one who would cause it to advance forward toward its end goal. Verse 1 opens by telling us Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah, and then it tells us she bore Abraham six more sons, probably daughters as well. Many people throughout time have wondered about this. Why would Abraham take another wife in his old age? And how could he have more children at this old age? When we are told at this point, he would have been 140 years old. Calvin, whom I love and read every week, I think at this point misses the mark. He talks about this same question, and he says, It seems very absurd that Abraham, who is said to have been dead in his own body 38 years before the decease of Sarah, should after her death marry another wife. Such an act was certainly unworthy of his gravity. Besides, when Paul comments about his faith in Romans 4, he not only asserts that the womb of Sarah was dead, but also that the body of the father himself was dead. Therefore, Abraham acted foolishly. If, after the loss of his wife, in his decrepit old age, contracted another marriage. Further, it is at variance with the language of Paul, that he who is in his hundredth year was cold and impotent should 40 years later have many sons. Now, again, I really appreciate Calvin, and he was much more brilliant than I ever hoped to be, but I must disagree with him at this point. It made me smile as I was reading this this week. Every person is different. And when we lose a spouse, that causes us to go through many different things, and everyone responds to that in a different way. Some cannot ever imagine getting married a second time, while others cannot imagine life without being married. And God gives freedom to each person to choose which is the best for them in their situation. Both can be good and biblical choices for different people. So for Abraham to get married at 140 meant that he still had 35 years to enjoy companionship and the blessings of friendship with his wife, Keturah. And if nothing more, that shows us that Abraham lived out his days on earth blessed by God. And that is not ridiculous blessed by God, enjoying what he had given him, and also having the blessing of raising more children to know God. There is nothing absurd about that. He still had life to live, <coughs> and he shared it with someone. As for the biology question and his age, yes, it is true. Romans 4, 18 through 20 says, Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered that his own body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of his wife. In other words, at age 100, some 40 years earlier, both Abraham and Sarah, his wife, were unable to have children. They were both old, and their bodies did not work any longer in that way. However, that was talking about their bodies before God renewed their abilities to have children. But then God gave them a miracle birth. This was not the greatest miracle birth, a virgin birth, like the greatest miracle that took place later with Mary. But it was a miracle nonetheless, and it was a miracle that was meant to foreshadow that greatest miracle birth that would come 
And we see in this miracle birth that without divine intervention, without God's hand at work, they would have never had Isaac. God enabled both of them to have their bodies rejuvenated long after they had stopped having children, and God miraculously gave them a son. And there is no reason to believe that Abraham's body stopped working again. In fact, six sons later and a second wife is proof that it did not stop working. And that is the view of early church father Augustine or people like Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry wrote, the strength he received by the promise still remained in him to show how much the virtue of the promise exceeds in the power of nature. In other words, for the glory of God, it continued. For the glory of God, it continued to display how amazing he was. In verse 1, Keturah is called Abraham's wife. But then in verse 6, it gets a little uncomfortable for us today. But the sons of his concubines, plural, to them Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, and he sent them away from his son Isaac. And this causes confusion for many of us. And it raises questions. And it was meant to raise questions, but it was not meant to raise eyebrows. It is there in order to make one of the key points of the passage that there was one person chosen by God to receive the inheritance and to advance his gospel plans to make that point stand out to all of us. You see, throughout different time periods and cultures, there has not been one definition of what a concubine is or how laws were put into place dealing with that subject or how the children of concubines were to be treated, especially with regard to things such as freedom for servants who became concubines, divorce or inheritance, and how that was to be passed down to children. For example, there were differences between the time of Abraham and the time of Moses with regard to concubines. And there is a lot of difference between the Code of Hammurabi and the Greeks and the Romans and God's word. But generally speaking, a concubine was a second wife, often but not always taken from a person's servants. She was considered a wife who held inferior rank or position and whose children had an inferior rank or position according to a legal status, not according to value in God's eyes or as a human being. Sometimes a concubine was taken as a second wife, taken along side an existing wife or wives in a sinful polygamous marriage, as was the case when Abraham took Hagar. Sometimes a concubine was a second wife taken after the death of a first wife, as was the case with Keturah, and in that case it is not sin. Early on in the culture, it served the purpose of providing an heir. When the primary wife could not have a son, though that was never God's design, and it was never his plan for marriage or for children. But as the practice grew, it degenerated further and further into a way of adult indulging lust and also a way of cementing political alliances. As was the case with Solomon. Often people think about Solomon and they just think about the first issue, but more than likely, many of his wives came as different countries came and wanted to have a political alliance with him. And often what they would do is they would bring gifts and give gifts, and it was seen as something that was terrible if he would say, no, I will not receive this gift. And I'm sure you're tracking ahead of me. Often the gift included people. So God regulated the practice in the civil law, the laws that were given to the nation of Israel for that time, much like he did with divorce in order to protect people, especially women and children, because of the hard hearts of the people, knowing that not everyone in the nation of Israel or the covenant community of God were believers. Not everyone cared about following God's moral law. Not everyone cared about living for God out of love and gratitude. So in order to protect people in the civil law, he caused these laws to be loud and clear to everyone, to be something that would protect those who are vulnerable. And so he regulated things like divorce and he regulated things like this. 
But the point being made here by calling Keturah his wife in verse 1 and his concubine in verse 6, and additionally in 1 Chronicles 1.32, which men mentions this as well, is that even as his wife, <clears throat> she did not have the same legal position as Sarah had as the mother of the promised child. She was not the matriarch of the covenant. And the children were not the promised one to carry this on forward. There is separation that is taking place here for a gospel reason. This set Sarah apart, and it showed that none of Keturah's children became the heirs of the promise or affected God's plan of rescue or redemption in any way. This distinction showed one last time very clearly something that God has taught us already several times in Genesis. Namely, there is one heir, the promise of the land, building a nation of people, and eventually the Messiah who would come through that nation. And the heir was Isaac. And that would point forward to the Messiah. Abraham's only son, born by divine intervention through Sarah, born through a miracle, was the one who was chosen to be a type of Christ, to foreshadow Christ. That distinction did not mean a lack of love for Keturah or for his kids through her. Although when we read it, it can seem quite harsh without understanding. It did not mean they were outside of God's love or God's ability to save them spiritually for all eternity. Just they were not chosen to be the instrument to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant and to advance his story of salvation because that belonged to the chosen one. And that title should cause us immediately to think of Christ, even if we know nothing else. Each of Keturah's children were a blessing to Abraham, as Psalm 127 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. But notice verse 5 highlights they did not receive the inheritance tied to the Abrahamic covenant, saying Abraham gave them all gifts. The word gave is past tense. In other words, he had already given everything to Isaac, even before he married Keturah and had more children. So she would have known this going into her marriage, especially if she was a former servant who saw everything that was going on in his family before becoming his wife. Second, notice verse 6, which says, But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts, and then he sent them away. Concubines is plural here, because this is focused on Keturah and her sons, but it also includes Hagar and her son Ishmael as well. Both women can rightly be called concubines and wives as it, this passage calls Keturah both, and chapter 16 calls Hagar his wife, and tells us even though he secured Isaac's inheritance in the land as God had directed, Abraham still blessed his children, including Ishmael, which shows that there was an ongoing relationship with Ishmael and between the two brothers, even after he was sent away. He blessed them with gifts, showing his love for them, showing his goodwill for them. In other words, there is love in this passage that is so easily missed. In other words, as they grew up and they became adults, then he sent them out to make a life for their own. But the key point here is that only Isaac remained in the land, the land that Abraham didn't even deserve himself, that Isaac did not deserve himself. It was a gift that God called him to for a specific purpose. And so all the rest of the sons were sent to live outside of the promised land. They were chosen, only Isaac was chosen to live in the land for the purpose that God had for that land. All of Abraham's sons were raised up to trust in the Lord and his gospel promise. We know that because we know human nature. We know that that's what we want for our children. We know that Abraham lived for God above all else. So we know that that's what he would have done with his kids. All were in the covenants and received the mark of the covenant in their flesh, just as it was commanded back in chapter 17. <clears throat> 
Everyone living in Abraham's household was to receive the mark in their flesh. But sending them all out of the land, except for Isaac, made it clear that God had called their half-brother to something special, to something unique, to something that they were supposed to watch God as he unfolded his plan or his story. And they were called to have faith in that as well. And if they did, then they would also be on the way to heaven. They would also continue in the covenant. But if they did not, then they would be considered outside of the covenant. And sadly, that is what happened. Isaac was the only one chosen to advance the plans of God and build upon all that God had accomplished through his father. And that should have caused all the rest of his half-brothers to watch in anticipation, but also in worship and in faith, and to pass that on to their children, the children who are listed in this passage. But sadly, that is not what happened, and it is not the story of history, and we still see that hatred lived out today. In verses 7 through 11, we are told Abraham died at 175, at a good old age, and he was gathered to his people. This is meant to highlight Abraham's faith in God and God's plans of redemption throughout his life and call us to the same faith. Remember back in chapter 12, Abraham was 75 years old when God called him out from Ur in his old life. And he gave him the gift of faith. And that means that Abraham walked with God for a hundred years through many trials and difficult challenges, but a hundred years of faith. And he kept his eyes on the promise of God. And that is why these things could be said about his life. It was a good life because of faith. And he was full and satisfied because God fulfilled what God promised in chapter 15, saying, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. And so we see prophecy fulfilled here. Then we are told he was gathered to his people, which further is meant to point to the goodness of God and to life after this life. This is not just a euphemism for death. It is not a nice way of saying he died. Notice these verses already told us plainly that he had died. And right after this, they tell us about his burial alongside his wife, Sarah, which means he was not buried with his earthly people or his earthly ancestors. And so we must ask, what does this mean? His people refers to his spiritual ancestors, people of faith, people who had gone before him, people in the line of faith that began with Eve, people like Noah and Enoch and Abel. We are told the same thing about Aaron with his death later on in Numbers 20 and with Moses and his death in Deuteronomy 32. And what is meant each time by this phrase is life goes on after death because people possess an immortal soul. Death is simply a transition to the afterlife where we will be gathered to our people. In other words, to the type of people who we were like spiritually, either people of faith gathered together in heaven or people without faith sadly gathered together in hell. In these final things that are said about Abraham, God shows us that having a truly good and full life is wrapped up in God, our creator and our redeemer, the one who made us to have a relationship with him and find our purpose in walking with him just as Abraham did. But God also reminds us that even a life as long as 175 years, double the average lifespan that any of us will ever see, is still extremely short. It is just a drop in the ocean of eternity. And we need to learn that lesson. And that is why Psalm 90, Moses told us, number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And it is merciful to remind us of this, causing us to look beyond this life to the eternal reason why God called Abraham to this promised land in the first place. And the reason why God chose his son and only one son to be the promised and sole heir to advance his plans. And it is mercy that God had 
all of the other sons sent out of the land. The rest of Abraham's sons may not have liked being sent away or only receiving gifts instead of being included in the divine inheritance. But God had a good reason for what he did and why he did it, even if they did not accept it in faith. Now, we do not know much about each son or what were the thoughts going on in their head, but we can piece the puzzle together enough based on other scriptures. We know faith in God and his plan of salvation was not passed down to most of these people, to Keturah's sons or Hagar's sons in any lasting way. The rest of the Old Testament tells us this and makes it very clear. They went on to become people and nations, and that's why at the end of this we see that they are called princes. And we see that those people groups became the enemies of God, and they fought against God over and over throughout the Old Testament. And this section ends in verse 18, telling us Ishmael's descendants settled over against all his kinsmen. This not only shows us that they were not going to continue to walk in the faith that Abraham had implanted as they were growing up in his family, but it is a fulfillment of prophecy because we were told in Genesis 16, 12, just that very fact that Ishmael would grow up and be a wild donkey of a man who would dwell over against all of his kinsmen. What was the reason for choosing only one son? It is because Isaac is a type of Christ. A type is a picture prophecy. And it points us directly to Christ this morning and informs us that there is only one Savior. There is only one way that God has provided for his people to be forgiven and reconciled to God there is only one way to make it up the mountain, so to say, and to spend eternity with God. Today, as it was in the time of Isaac and all of his half-brothers, whether people like it or not, and we know this is not popular, God's exclusive choice was necessary. Isaac, the son of the prophetic promise, given to Abraham in chapter 12 too, I will make you a great nation. In chapter 15, 4 through 5, this man shall not be your heir, but a son shall be your heir. It was a promise that stood out, but it did not stand alone in a vacuum. It was a promise that was built upon and advanced God's original promise given in Genesis 3.15 to Adam and Eve that he would send the Messiah, the one who would take our place as our substitute, that then is shown over and over throughout the Old Testament, through all the animal sacrifices, the reason why he was going to come, the reason why there could only be one who would fulfill this. And this foreshadows that, because there could only be one who is fully God and fully man. Isaac was a miracle baby who came into the world through divine means. Both Abraham and Sarah were unable to have children. God purposely waited until they were 190. He did that so it was completely clear that there was no other way for them to have a child except by the hand of God. And that foreshadowed Jesus and the ultimate miracle birth to come, the greater miracle of birth, the virgin birth, that shows us that there was absolutely no other way for this to happen other than the hand and plan of God. Isaac was a man of faith who trusted God in his plan of salvation, though he wavered at times, and we will see that. He was a man who knew that God was using him to advance his plan and he received that gift just as his father had done. But he also knew from the experiences of his father that God did not allow alternatives to his plan or deviations from his plan, which God made clear in chapter 15 when he cut the covenant, showing his father what sin deserves, the death of the animals that he walked through. And he knew that story. And he knew that only God walked through those animal pieces. And God was saying he would forgive the sins by taking that death that we deserved. And he knew there was only one who could do that. 
Isaac foreshadowed Jesus, the ultimate person of faith, the only way of salvation, the one who trusted in God his Father perfectly, unlike anyone else, Abraham, Isaac, or anyone else. Jesus was the one who trusted with perfect faith, never wavering, not when he cried out in the garden, not when they scourged him and ripped the flesh off of his back, not when they nailed him to the cross and when he died. Because Jesus knew there was only one way to save us from our sins, to become the God-man, fully God and fully man in one person, so that he could die as our substitute, taking the punishment that every one of us deserve. Isaac was the only one chosen to advance God's plans at this point, because that foreshadowed what was to come that God the Father would send his one and only Son to provide his one and only way to be saved. Galatians 3.16 tells us, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to your offsprings, plural, referring to many, but it tells us that it's referring to one. It says, and to your offspring who is Christ. And that tells us the chosen line of Abraham's offspring, beginning with Isaac, followed up by Jacob, who had his name changed to Israel, and his 12 sons that we will study very soon ended up becoming the nation of Israel. And that ultimately ended up ushering in Christ, the Messiah, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to get to the Father. Isaac was the sole heir of the land and the promise. Jesus fulfilled everything. Hebrews 1, as we read already this morning, says he was appointed the sole heir of all things. Isaac settled in Bir Lahairoi, and that is significant because it was the place that would constantly remind him of all that God had done in the past, causing him to trust in God for his future. It was the place of promise and warning, the place that reminded Isaac that God is good and the only way, because it was the place where God initially met Hagar when she was fleeing from Abraham's house, and God saved her from herself and saved her from her own plans, telling her to return home and submit to God's plan and faith. And then it was the place that God promised that Hagar would have a son as well, showing his goodness, showing that there was a future for her as well if she would follow in faith. And therefore, it is the place that first was used to really show her the gospel and to really take all the things that Abraham had gone through and taught her and bring it down to her life. She said at that place, you are the God who sees me. And that would have reminded Isaac of God's care for Hagar and Ishmael, his half-brother, that he just buried his father together with his half-brother. When they were out in the same southern wilderness, in the time that his half-brother almost died of thirst, and God rescued him and saved them in that same region, it would have reminded him again of that. But even more, it would have reminded Isaac that God saw more than the physical needs that Hagar had when she ran away and the physical needs the second time when they were out in the wilderness. But God saw the deeper spiritual need that we all have to be rescued from our sin and that there is only one way for that to happen through the ultimate chosen one to come, the one that he was a type of, a place that also pointed ahead to that and reminded him of that. Jesus became the sole heir who alone inherited the entire kingdom from his father. And he shares what is his with everyone who is united to him in faith, adopted into his family. Which is why 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 can tell us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. 
no matter how long we may live on this earth. We all know life is short, but eventually every one of us will stand before this God who is merciful and loving as we see here. And the place where we will go after this life, either to heaven with Jesus or hell and separation from his love for all eternity, will go on for just that, all eternity, whether we live what we consider a short life or a life as long as Abraham in this passage, it is short in comparison to eternity. And this teaching may not be popular today, but it is the truth. And we need to rest in it and boldly share it with love that is reflected here in this passage. There is only one heir to the kingdom of heaven, and that is Jesus. And there is only one way to be welcomed into his eternal kingdom and to go to our people if our people are people of faith. And that is for us to turn from sin, to trust in Jesus through repentance and faith, trusting in all that he accomplished for us through his perfect life, his substitutionary death, his victorious resurrection. Is that your inheritance? I pray that it is. Amen. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this difficult passage, and we thank you for how it points us to Christ. Grow our love and appreciation for him as we see his love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.